Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott. And in this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing ATI physical therapy stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. ATI Physical Therapy provides outpatient physical therapy services. It owns and operates 889 physical therapy clinics in 24 states with a staff of 5,000 physical therapists and 5 million patient visits annually. The company offers a variety of services within its clinics, including physical therapy to treat spine, shoulder, knee, and neck injuries. It also provides work injury rehab services. The company is headquartered in Bolingbrook, Illinois, and was founded in 1996. It was funded by a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company is formed to raise money through an IPO, then acquire a private business to help them go public. At the time of their IPOs, SPACs have no existing business operations or even a company they plan to acquire. SPACs have two years to complete an acquisition or they must return the funds back to investors. The SPAC was started by Fortress Value Acquisition Corp. 2, and they valued ATI at $2.5 billion, including debt. ATI received $645 million in cash from the merger. The company is currently trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, $669 million market cap. They're trading at $340 a share, and they have $197 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. There's not much financial information on this company since they recently went public. In their most recent quarterly reporting, they do show their first six months of 2021 financials and they compare it to the first six months of 2020. So to get their 2020 and 2021 financials, I just multiplied the first six months number by two. So it is an estimate. They did have a good amount of free cash flow before they were acquired, 241 million, but negative 54 million in 2021. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was negative each year, a big negative in 2021. Revenue is a sales for the company. That looks pretty good, 581 million up to 626 million. This is the company's income statement from their 10Q. So they compare the second quarter of 2021 to the second quarter of 2020. They also compare the first six months of 2021 to the first six months of 2020. So their revenue does look pretty good. It goes up from 290 million to 313 million. And their quarterly revenue looks even better from 108 million to 164 million. About 60% of their revenue goes into salaries. Their payroll was $162 million out of $278 million of revenue. This business is not as scalable as say a tech company because they need to have a person there to do the physical therapy. It's not like a customer can go online and buy something and you could have millions of people going onto your website and buying stuff and you don't need many employees. But every time a person comes into your clinic, you need an actual employee there to do the service. Their rent was 87 million. So that seems like it's about 27, 28% of their revenue and provision for doubtful accounts. So it looks like they extend credit. So provision for doubtful accounts is the amount they expect not to receive from their accounts receivables. This is a non-cash item. So we have to add it back on the statement of cash flows. They have 51 million in SGNA. This is payroll and marketing. They reported a $467 million impairment loss. In the past, they acquired a company, and in this reporting period, they're writing down that investment. They're writing down the goodwill and the trademark. When they acquired this firm in the past, that's when the cash left the company. So it could have been three, five, ten years ago. And now this year, they're deducing the value of that company should have been less. So they're writing down the value. So they're reducing the amount on their balance sheet and passing through a loss onto the income statement. But the cash occurred years ago, so it's a non-cash item today. So we have to add it back on a statement of cash flows. An impairment like this, I would usually ignore, a goodwill impairment. So if you added it back, they would actually have positive operating cash flow in the first half of 2021. They pay 32 million of interest on their debt and 10 million of interest on preferred stock. So they do have a big negative net income, but it's mainly due to this large asset impairment. They had a small negative net income in the first half of 2020. This is the cash flow from operations section on the statement of cash flows. CFO is like net income converted to cash. 
because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So to calculate CFO, you start with net income or net loss in their case, negative 470 million. You add back the asset impairment. You add back depreciation and the allowance for doubtful accounts. They received a $31 million tax credit. So we have to minus that out in our CFO section. You also have to adjust for changes in working capital. So even though they reported this big net loss, they actually only lost $27 million of cash flow. And in the first half of 2020, they added $121 million of cash flow. So it doesn't look that bad as the financial statements indicate. That's why I like looking at the CFO number. It's a much better indicator of how the company's doing. Unless there's really large movements and changes in working capital, that can also skew the numbers. But in their case, these numbers aren't too relevant. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have $822 million of equity. They raised $1.3 billion from selling their business. And they've lost $536 million from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure. $822 million of equity, $555 million of debt. They're 60% equity, 40% debt. And their weighted average cost of capital is 9.6%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated six years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year six. That's 1.8 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today's new weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $1.2 billion. We divide that by 197 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $6.12. They're trading at 340, so they're trading at a 44% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. According to Simply Wall Street, the average analyst projects their revenue to grow 11.7%. I grew their revenue 11.7% for the next six years. And I gave them negative free cash flow in 2022, 23, and 24. Because they had negative free cash flow in the first half of 2021. And I gave them their first positive free cash flow in 2025. The way I calculated their future free cash flow, I just multiplied the revenue number by 10%. The average company converts 10% of their revenue to free cash flow. Simply Wall Street is even higher than me. They're at 1226. So they're saying the stock is 72% undervalued. Four analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $5. According to tip ranks, four analysts rate this a hold and their average price target is also $5. I saw someone do a YouTube video on this company back in July and they had a picture of tip ranks on their video. Two analysts rated a buy and the average price target was $13. That's when the stock was trading at about $8 or $9. When an analyst prices a stock, they're just saying how much investors are willing to pay. They're not saying how much a company is worth. My valuation would stay exactly the same no matter what the stock price is. The only time my valuation really moves is when a company comes out with new financial information. Because each individual has its own perceived value on things. Say you had $200,000 to your name. And that included cash in the bank, investments, retirement, and maybe equity in your home. If a Lamborghini was selling for $200,000, you probably wouldn't buy it. You wouldn't want to put all your money into a car. So your perceived value of that Lamborghini is a lot lower than someone who has $100 million in the bank. What if somebody said to you, I can sell you this $200,000 Lamborghini for $50,000. And this was no trick. But they said the catch is you have to keep it and use it for yourself. You can't resell it you probably still would not buy it because you know $50,000, although that's a great deal for that Lamborghini, you probably have to spend a lot of money each year to maintain it. But what if there was no cash? The person said you could do whatever you want with it. You can use it or you can sell it. Then you might buy it because then you could resell it. And even if you only sold it for $100,000, which is half the price in the market, you would still double your investment. But then you may think, what if I can't find someone to buy it? And if you do find someone, you might have to haggle with them and then you run the risk of like dealing with a shady person, them trying to scam you. So a lot of things going on. So then you think twice about getting it. But say you perceive this stock as worth $10. You may buy it today at $340. Or you may not because you may think no one else thinks it's worth $10 even though I do. But say you think the stock is worth $2. So you wouldn't buy it because it's overvalued. But what if somebody said to you, I'm going to give you the stock for $2, as many shares as you want. You would of course buy it because you know the stock market is a liquid place and you can easily resell it right away within a second for around $3 to $3.40. Even if you bought a thousand shares, you can still sell it for over $3 right now. That's why the stock market is so different because it's so liquid. You know you can buy something and resell it at any time you want. It's not like that with a house or a car. It takes time and energy and you may lose money because it's not a liquid market like the stock market is. 
the company was a SPAC back in October 2020. And I think in February of 2021 is when they did the merger. And it was flat for a while, but then it dropped 65%. It's really struggled, this stock. Back in 2016, Advent, a private equity firm, acquired this company. And they own 63% of the stock. And since the SPAC was acquired by Fortress, it's gone down so much in price. So they lost $800 million on paper because they haven't sold their stock yet. If they do sell it, they'll realize the loss and it won't be on paper anymore. Right now, it's an unrealized loss of $800 million. I don't know what they paid for the company in 2016. If they paid $100 million for the company, then they're not doing that bad. But if they paid a billion dollars for the company, then it's bad because they could have sold up here when the market cap was two and a half billion dollars. Now the market cap is one third of what it was when it first started trading. Here's an interesting quote about SPACs. Companies that go public via SPAC tend not to have the stable, predictable business models than those that go public via a traditional IPO. If this company was so strong and solid, why didn't they just IPO normally? Why did they have to go the SPAC route? Just something to consider because a lot of these private equity companies, companies that own SPACs like Fortress, they're just looking to make a quick flip. So they just want to find a private company out there that they can acquire. And then once they do that, they sell most of their stock and take in the profits. I'm not saying Fortress is shady, but everybody's looking to make money. And you shouldn't really trust all these investment bankers. And it gives you examples of a couple of SPACs that have really crashed, like Lordstown and Highcroft Mining. And you can see this huge gap down, and the gap has not been filled. It keeps going down the stock. The reason for this big gap down is because the company came out with its projections, and their future revenue estimates are a lot lower than the market anticipated. So there was a big sell-off. 90% of gaps get filled. So 90% of the time, the stock will come up to fill this gap. But 10% of the time, it doesn't. The stock is down 66% in the last 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 31%. The low was 280, the high was 13, and the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. 1.3 to 2.3 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 197 million shares outstanding, 50 million are on float. When a share is on float, that means it's available for people like me and you to purchase. The 146 million shares not on float are held by insiders and cannot be purchased. They can sell their shares, but no one can purchase them in an open market. 94% of the stock is held by institutions, which is really high, that's surprising. And 1.4% of the shares are shorted. Analysts are really bullish, projecting their earnings to grow 54%, their revenue to grow 12%. If you put $10,000 into this company when it started trading, you'd be down to $3,500 today, a 65% loss. The biggest shareholder is Advent. They're the private equity firm that owned this company before they started trading publicly. They own 66%. Then the SPAC that acquired the company, they own 8% Fortress. Then Lazard, Weiss, and the Phoenix Investment and Finances Company. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have negative net income, so we can't look at the PE. Their market cap has come down a lot, so their price to sales looks really good at 1.1. They also have a really good price to book of 0.8. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is on the balance sheet. It's assets minus liabilities. And they have $822 million of equity. They have nearly $900 million of goodwill on their balance sheet. So they have negative tangible book value. Their current ratio and quick ratio are good at 1.4. They have $91 million of cash on their balance sheet and $88 million of accounts receivables. This $88 million is the money that's owed to them from their customers minus the allowance for doubtful accounts. It looks like they're gonna have negative 54 million of free cash flow in 2021, and they have positive 57 million of working capital. So it looks like they may need debt or equity financing because they're gonna be short on funds. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of five companies in the same industry as ATI, and if ATI has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So we can't look at their PE, most companies in this industry have a really good price to sales ratio, except Well Health. They have the best price to book. They have a good current ratio, a bad ROE. They're lower than average in debt. And all these companies are pretty small, except for DeVita. And they don't pay a dividend, but two companies in this industry pay over 6% in dividends. So if you're into dividend paying stocks, check out Extendicare or Sienna Living. So to summarize, I have them training at a 44% discount. Their financials look okay. Their revenue is going up, and that's what I really focus on, as long as their revenue is increasing. 
Because if you look at the income statement, there's a lot of accounting things going on. Accounting adjustments can't really affect revenue, so that's a good number to focus on. If you're bullish on this company, I don't see anything wrong with that, but I'm not sure there's many people out there who feel the same way as you. I think investors are getting a little weary about all these SPACs, and especially this one and the ones that have dropped over 50% within six months of IPOing. I wouldn't be surprised if the stock price came down to $2, but it could take a while to get back up there to $10. It could take many years. It's really hard to predict these things. Only time will tell. I ranked their free cash flows 5 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 5 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.